Well, welcome to my own personal do-over of the Pet Safety Crusaders, that's me, vlog. Um, I do this twice weekly, and I understand the one I just did had terrible audio, so I'm really hoping um, that this is going better. If you're listening and can give me a thumbs up to know that the audio is okay now, I really appreciate it. But I do come to you twice weekly via my vlog. Um, to bring you pet health and safety tips and hoping that in turn it, you can make a difference in the life of an animal. So it looks like we're doing a little bit better now. I apologize and boy, I can't believe I'm gonna go through this again because that was a tough one for me to talk about. But here we go. What we're gonna cover today is um, dog fighting awareness, dog bite prevention, animal control officers appreciation week, and also April all month long is Pet First Aid Awareness Month. So I just wanna remind you that if you haven't boned up on your skills recently, I do offer live teleconferences and the way they work is you can see me, I can watch you practice, I'll demonstrate, you'll see my slides and videos, and you do have to register ahead of time because I send you a little package in the mail that is the complement of all of the pet um, pocket guides for both dogs and cats, and along with a package of bandaging and muzzling materials so that from the comfort of your home, living room, bedroom, dining room, whatever room you want to learn from, and your computer or other device, um, you can practice on a pet at home or preferably a stuffed animal, and upon completion, you do receive a certificate. So um, you go to PetSafetyCrusader.com for that. But let me get back into this tough stuff um, I was talking about earlier, and that is Dog Fighting Awareness Week. Um, dog fighting is a sport, if you want to call it that, that has historically thrived on the whole premise or the ability to keep itself secret. Um, it, it happens in secret locations, and for the most part, it avoids attention by the general public or even the, the law enforcement. Strangely enough, you'll come across people who really don't believe it even exists today, and it does. It's pretty much remained unchanged in the United States for about the last 150 years with just a few differences I will share with you um, in a moment. What, however, did bring it to light um, to a lot of people was the 2007 um, arrest and conviction of NFL Michael Vick um, and you know whenever celebrities do anything in my mind I don't like to use the word celebrity here I have to say monster but that's my own personal opinion but um, Vick and then some other people in the um, athletics and entertainment industry were busted for um, dog fighting that's brought it more, more to the general public's attention but still you'll come across people that just don't really believe it's a problem or really exists um, just a few years after Michael Vick's arrest in 2009, the largest dog fighting raid ever um, was conducted and nearly 400 dogs were confiscated um, at more than 20 locations in eight different cities. So the Humane Society of the United States and the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals are the ones that, you know, in conjunction with local law enforcement um, have really been making a difference. Actually, the ASPCA in, um, I think it was in the late 18 or mid 1800s, conducted the first bust of a dog fighting ring. That was one of the, the first official things to happen. Um, what has changed a little bit is that the professional fighting rings um, of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s that were really out in rural private areas have now moved inside. It's kind of a new generation of street fighters, so to speak. And um, the, the fights actually occur in more urban and open areas and actually pretty frequently. So, you know, they are more likely to get caught, I hope. But in the meantime, so many animals are suffering, whether they're the animals that have actually um, been chosen to fight or the dogs that have been thrown in the ring to pretty much be mauled. The use of dogs against lions and wild boar and bulls and bears, you know, dates back like 3,000 years on, the, I won't say on the walls of caves, but um, on the walls in, you know, Roman settlements, you'll actually see something very similar to dogs bringing down animals and even humans. Uh, large bulldogs were widely used during the Middle Ages to um, bring down bulls. They would chase the bulls into the, the 
the town area and then literally take them down uh, on behalf of the butchers. I mean, that's who the, you know, was, was causing this to happen. Um, bull baiting continued in the 10th and 11th century um, and, and citizens actually found it entertaining. Under the reign of King Henry VIII, we've all heard about him for other reasons, he actually developed a bear garden. I'm sure there was beer too or meat or whatever happened to be that, the drink of the day, but it was a bear garden where people would pay a penny to come and watch the dogs kill the bear. Um, at this time, they were starting to use more and more the smaller, more nimble, dog, nimble dogs, and then they started breeding them um, or I should say crossbreeding them with um, the terriers who were actually thrown in the pits to kill rats. Um, did you hear that word pit? That's kind of where all of this came about with our, our precious pit bull friends and the start of, you know, having animals in a pit bite each other. Um, I love to refer to um, American Staffordshire Terriers and their, their mixes as Pibbles, P-I-B-B-L-E-S, because the ones I have known are so loving and nurturing. And if you go back to the 60s, our gang series, you'll see that, you know, the pit bull was always hanging around with the kids. In Great Britain, pit bulls, you'll see pictures of them by prams, strollers, you know, watching children. Um, the RCA logo had a pit bull on it. I guess I'm really dating myself with some of this, but they, they, you know, it's it's us humans. We first picked on the bloodhound, then I believe it was the Rottweiler, the Doberman, the German Shepherd, and now the pit bull has been around as the, um, you know, the the dog of the day to give a bum rap to, and it's because of these things that we're doing to them, um, you know, and, and and throwing them in the pits and making them fight. Uh, there was actually in 1835, it was called the England Humane. Act. And what it did was it banned bull baiting, but it left the bear fighting. And what it really did was increase um, the dog fighting as, as a sport. And uh, people found that to be a suitable alternative to seeing the dogs take the bulls down to, for the dogs to fight each other. And that led to dog fighting come to, coming to America, where mastiffs and larger breeds were used around the Civil War. But um, then it started being these smaller ones that were mixed with terrier. Oddly enough, it really proliferated in the Northeast. And there was, what is the name of the, it called, was called the Police Gazette. This is what I find very interesting. Um, ironically, dog fighting was a, a source of common entertainment, or I should say great entertainment, for police officers and firemen that actually immigrated here from England and Ireland. And this police gazette that was a, you know, a newspaper that reported on crimes also listed all the places for dog fighting and spelled out the rules. So it's just, you know, really ironic that, you know, at one point in time, it was the police and the firemen that were enjoying the sport, but I'm glad that has changed. Um, in the last decade, we're, we brought more and more attention to it, and hopefully we can continue to do so. And what I want everybody to know that dog fighting is illegal in all 50 United States. It's actually considered a felony in all states. Um, what varies from state to state is whether just having fighting dogs is a felony or, and if participating is a felony. That can vary from state to state, but... Um, it, it is illegal. Dog fighting is illegal and is considered a felony. Um, if you go to animallaw.com slash info, you can find out information pertaining to your state and what the laws are. But hopefully we can change that so it's, you know, illegal across the board. What I just want to show you a little bit about and tell you so that we realize that this is a whole community involvement thing that we all need to keep our eyes and ears open. And it's like what, you know, is happening in schools with kids right now with gunshots and other things that if you see something, you need to tell someone. Um, it's just so important. Here's how sometimes dog fighting rings are found out because somebody's just noticing some little thing. Say a concerned citizen um, is hearing a lot of noise in the alley. They call 911. By the time police officers respond, whatever was going on is stopped. But there's generally beer cans around, a lot of cigarette butts, and there might be a weak and injured dog. No one, as the police officers come, claim to have seen anything happen. But that's a, a clue. Occasionally, the sanitation department, the refuge company, the garbage company, whatever you call them in your area, 
will just find two dead in, um, pit bulls laying in a ditch and they look pretty scarred and you know mangled up. The housing authority may report having to remove several unauthorized dogs because they're suddenly attacking the pet dogs in the building. Well, obviously, if dogs are trained to fight other dogs, they're not going to be, you know, so friendly to other dogs they encounter. Um, it could be that animal control officers are just suddenly picking up, you know, quite a few pit bulls in the area, and they all seem to have some kind of injury. They may have the ears cut off. They may have scratches or bite wounds. Any of these things start to lead up to knowing that there is fighting in your area. And I think a lot of you would be really shocked to find out that maybe within a five mile radius of where you live, it's very likely this is happening. Sometimes police narcotic units report finding several dogs and, uh, and drug, par drug, excuse me, drug paraphernalia when they you know, investigate or do a drug bust. Drugs and dog fighting, you know, meth labs and other kinds of drug use um, often coincide with dog fighting rings. Um, another clue is that sometimes school officials will start noticing that the kids, particularly in high school, I hope not even younger, um, but are starting to wear more and more t-shirts that have some sort of dog fighting theme on them. So, you know, it's important we ask kids questions. It's important we keep our eyes open around adults and we all work together to stop this from happening. Some terms you may hear kids or, or people use or items you might see that can also alert you are what are called break sticks. They're large sticks that are inserted into the mouth of a dog when he's fighting to um, get him to stop, you know, and let go of whatever animal person um, he's fighting with. A flirt pole is I like to think of it, I don't like to think of it, but I do think of it as similar to what a lot of people exercise their kitty cats with, kind of, you know, a stick with a string and a feather or a toy on it for the cats. While we're talking something much bigger, it might have a hunk of meat, um, a bone or a toy on it, but it is um, one of the ways they exercise dogs. I really hate the name of this, but it's called a rape stand, and it's simply where a female is, you know, uh, confined so that um, she can be bred and they will have more puppies for bait dogs or more puppies for fighting in the near future. If you see wash tubs around, of course somebody can have a wash tub and use it to wash their dog or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to tell you every time you see one of these things, it means there's a fighting ring, but it's things to look for. Wash tubs are often prevalent at fighting rings simply because before an animal goes in the ring, they might hose him off and wash him down because they're afraid a competitor might have put a noxious substance on that dog's coat so that when the other dog bites at him, he'll ingest that poison and go down much more quickly. Um, just a, a double whammy of horribleness, but something to keep an eye out for. Barrels or half barrels are often used as shelters, but if there are barrels around or if there are a lot of dog houses and big heavy chains, um, also treadmills, which are ways that they exercise the dogs. And then additionally, when you're seeing, like we, you know, I said a moment ago, drug paraphernalia, needles, a lot of beer bottles, alcohol bottles, um, you know, cigarette butts around, in combination with other things, this should alert you to alert somebody else. If you want to get more involved in this, I hope you will on some level or encourage the appropriate people in your community to. A great resource is, is, is Dog Fighting, a guide for community action, and you can locate it at ASPCA Pro, ASPCA PRO dot org, and just, um, you know, uh, search for additional information. So there's so much more to say on this subject, but I just had to bring it to light. Um, today a little bit to make us more aware. I next want to tackle Dog Bite Prevention Week, and that's our human responsibility. Uh, we need to train our pets to be obedient, but we have to set them up for success. Don't let them fail by leaving them to babysit the kid. Um, children can be, you know, don't understand, and they can pull ears or pull the tail or stick crayons in the ear. They may take the dog's toy or bother him while he's sleeping or eating. It's our responsibility. The dogs only have the way to respond with a grumble, which usually comes first, or a snap. And, you know, obviously it can be dangerous. I will tell you, though, that 5% of the time when humans are bitten, we don't get an infection. With cats, that number's way over 50% because their more needle-like teeth and their saliva do cause us problems. 
But that is said, I do realize that the injury can go beyond infection. Um, four and a half million people are bitten by dogs every year, and about 800,000 of them end up needing medical care, half of which are children. So teach the young, but also remember ourselves as older people. And a lot of us, I see those of you that are watching, and we all love animals, and we certainly hope all dogs love us. But you have to remember an animal doesn't know us. And we, no matter, even if it's a Great Dane or, you know, a Newfie, we're pretty much towering over the animal. So remember yourself and teach kids never to try to pet on the head, because look at that. It's looking like a slap to the face. Always give them the hand to sniff first, and then work the way up the chest and the neck and behind the ear to give a scratch, but not here on the top of the head. I often tell children to stand still like a tree and let the animal sniff them first and then, you know, start off that way. It often is helpful if we stand sideways and if we look at their paws or their chest, keeping our eyes on them, but not making that eye contact which initiates that predator-prey response. Some people even say to crouch sideways, and I understand that because you want to appear a little bit smaller and not as threatening, but you also just want to be careful that from that crouch you can move back if, you know, you are too intimidating and the dog does snap at you. Um, you know, those are just some, some very basics. I encourage you, I just noticed that there's a webinar tomorrow, Tuesday, April 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern, a dog bite prevention webinar being given by Mikkel Beckel. Becker. I'm getting my L's and R's. Mikkel Becker. Um, Mikkel is Dr. Marty Becker's daughter. Dr. Marty Becker is America's veterinarian. He's an amazing man. He's lectured at every um, veterinary school in the country. I recently had the opportunity to um, speak with him, and I have also been on a panel where I've gotten to share some of his Fear Free initiative with pet owners as well. But he's amazing, and his daughter is equally amazing. So tune into her webinar. I think you need to register first. It's 1 p.m. tomorrow, and you need to go to Good dognabox.com to sign up for it. So you might get some more tips there that you can share with clients, with, you know, children, with just the average human who may think every dog loves them, but really needs to give that dog time to get to know him or her first. And finally, I'd like to conclude with this being Animal Control Officer Appreciation Week. And so many of us grew up watching the cartoons where there's the, the sneaking around uh, dog catcher with the net over his shoulder and he goes into people's yards and, and steals their dogs. That is not who our animal control officers are. I've had the pleasure of volunteering um, alongside so many of them over the years, and they all are really amazing people who care about animals. Sure, they have to put up a little block because their hearts are getting tromp trampled and stepped on and crushed every single day multiple times, but they really do have our pet's best interest at heart. Um, they have to rescue the animals. They're the ones chasing through the streets, either on foot or by cars, trying to prevent that dog who's gotten loose from getting hit by, you know, another car. They're the ones that may have to get, um, gosh, the dog out of the sewer grate or that's got his head stuck in a fence or the cat out of a tree. You know, sometimes those have to be the, the tree people, um, our tree trimmers, but, you know, they do so much to rescue our animals. They um, enforce animal law in your community. They, depending, you know, every shelter is a little different, so don't quote me verbatim on all of this, but for the most part, they can issue a warrant. If you have too many animals in your house, if the dog is barking constantly, if you own a rooster and roosters aren't allowed in that particular neighborhood, if you aren't cleaning up the dog poop, um, you know, anything that you aren't doing to keep your pets safe and to abide by the community rules, they can issue a warrant and they'll check back up on you to see if, you know, you've um, done what you're supposed to, and if not, then police officers, you know, will take it from there. Animal control officers check the kennels, the doggy daycare centers, the pet stores in their community to make sure animals are being well cared for. So they have a lot of responsibilities. They may work the front desk and be the one that has to intake a dog from a 14-year-old dog that the family just no longer wants and is relinquishing to a shelter. Um, on the opposite end, maybe they'll finally, you know, be at the counter too when that dog gets readopted. So, you know, there's just so many emotional up and ups and downs with their jobs. And again, depending on the particular shelter, um, years ago, I always thought it was the veterinarians that had this task. But in many shelters, the animal control officers and the kennel attendants, the task of euthanizing falls to them. 
And, you know, it can be a pet that certainly, you know, is in much distress and it's the kindest thing to do. But when it's a vibrant pet that's just been there too long and has now gotten cage crazy or they just can't get adopted out and there's no room. Um, and this may be a dog that this kennel attendant or this animal control officer is actually, um, you know, caught from traffic or that has spent time with, you know, over the days, weeks or months that the animal's been at the shelter. They may have to be the one to issue those final goodbyes, um, whether they make the decision which is hard enough, or the one that has to actually um, give the injection. So I just want to remind you that animal control officers do so much for, you know, our animals and the people that love them. So if you can, stop by and thank them. Bring them a box of donuts or a basket of fresh fruit, but just let them know that they are appreciated. And, um, you know, hopefully one day you'll be able to help them out by adopting a dog or a cat from them. Everybody have an awesome possum week. Remember, we still have some room in our May Pet First Aid live teleconference if you need to brush up on your skills. But just share, you know, some of the information I've given you today with others about, you know, keeping their eyes and ears open to find dog fighting rings. I'm not telling you to do anything dangerous, but if you notice something, tell somebody. And to, you know, keep our, our pets safe by not setting them up for disaster so that they do bite. Um, and again, thanking our animal control officers. I'll see you on Thursday. Have a great day.